When you think of the Ten Commandments, and they're all very important because they're the highest of moral, ethical, and spiritual standards, which of them is the worst sin when it comes to our neighbor? I would suggest it's the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill, or in the modern translation, Thou shalt not murder. In today's Global Pulpit, we look at the question, Who pulled the trigger? The real meaning to the Sixth Commandment. Be prepared for surprise and a great blessing. The Ten Commandments, the foundation of Western legal jurisprudence, the gold standard by which we are measured as sinners or saints. What I want to point out is the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill, or you shall not murder. On the surface, it seems simple. Someone kills somebody, they've sinned, they pay the price, either in execution, incarceration, and that's not to mention what happens in the life to come if they don't repent and receive the gospel. But we want to go further. There's been an era of assassination, which is political murder. The United States is no stranger to assassinations. Abraham Lincoln, James Garfield, William McKinley, John F. Kennedy were all U.S. presidents who were assassinated while in office. During the Cold War, you had three effective leaders in Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and John Paul II, and all three of them were targeted for assassination, which fortunately failed. And then in the United Kingdom, in recent years, there has been assassination of members of Parliament like Joe Cox in 2016 and David Ames in 2021. Think about it. Even Nigel Farage of the Reform Party, he's not been targeted with guns and knives, at least not that we're aware, but he's been receiving milkshakes thrown in his face during political campaigns. It is a form of assault, even if it's not lethal. So what's going on here? First of all, it talks about life as power and personal vulnerability. Think of it. You can be President of the United States, which at the current moment is the highest office in the world, or the most powerful, and yet you're still vulnerable by the limitations of the human body. But think of it. The civilized Japanese succumb to Tojo fascism, genocidal as well. Then the civilized, cultured Christian Germans they succumbed to Nazism. Think of it, in the 1930s, Hitler said, I have great hope for the success of our ideas because they are succeeding in the universities. Those same 1930s university graduates in the 1940s were part of Hitler's mass murder machine. How did this happen? And then what about, again, in the United Kingdom? You can't meet more Christian, more friendly, nicer people than those from Northern Ireland. They pray like sages. They're very, very wonderful. And yet, for 30 years, they had troubles killing each other. What is it in our human nature that causes us to transgress the Sixth Commandment? Let me suggest to you, there are four killers in this whole scheme of things. Not just the main killer, the one that pulls the trigger. Obviously, the one that pulls the trigger is a murderer. But murder doesn't start with pulling the trigger. It starts earlier in the heart and in the mind. That leads me to the second killer. It's called hateful thoughts, hateful actions, and hateful rhetoric. Have you noticed during the culture war, especially on social media, the rhetoric that comes out of people's pens, keyboard tappings, or mouths is horrible. Very abusive, hysterical, defamatory, and even violent. There has been talk of killing people, like Donald Trump. More people have talked about killing him out loud for the whole world to hear than anything else. Now, yes, he can dish it out too, but have you ever heard him? call for censorship, cancellation, or violence? Well, 
The road to violence is very simple. It starts with deception. And after deception, you have defamation, which is really a crime. And after defamation, you have demonization. The person you are defaming is demonized as if they're not worthy of even being a person living among them in society, which leads to destruction. So let me repeat, the road to violence begins with deception, defamation, demonization, and destruction. It tells us in Ma Proverbs, as well as Matthew, let me quote Proverbs first, Proverbs 18:21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Our words matter. And as it says in Matthew 12, verse 37, By your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Words are powerful. They can kill, and they can also heal. Then there's a third level of killer. Above the actual pulling the trigger, above the rhetoric, and that is our fallen human nature. Our fallen human carnal nature, which is the reason Christ came to this planet to redeem us, and the cross of Christ is, of course, the solution for the carnal human nature. But he, it says very clearly and simply in the epistle of James, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, here is the source of violence, killing, murder. James 4, verse 1, From whence comes wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire and cannot obtain. You fight and war, and yet ye have not, because ye ask not. That's James 4, verses 1 and 2. I urge you to take a closer look at it and ponder, meditate on its timeless precepts which are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Basically, the lust, the greed, the avarice, the covetousness are what causes us to war and to kill. And we need to find a solution to this, which I've already suggested, the cross of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, the word in your heart, the shed blood of the Lamb, all these, as well as the cross, as I said earlier, are the solution. But let me give you some examples in the Bible of the principles of James 4 in action. We start with Cain and Abel. They were brothers, possibly good mates, because there was hardly any other else around. And they played together, had good times together, enjoyed each other's company, and yet one slew the other. Why? I believe that Cain was jealous because God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but rejected Cain's. It's as simple as that. Here's another example from a normally noble figure, somebody who's mentioned 1,000 times in the Bible. His name is David. And he committed a horrible sin against his servant, one of his mighty men, named Uriah the Hittite, husband of Bathsheba. By coveting Bathsheba, committing adultery with her while her, her husband was doing David's bidding on the battlefield at Rabat Ammon, bringing him back to cover his tracks because Bathsheba was now pregnant by David. Uriah, being an honorable man, wouldn't go to his wife and do his duty, so David decided to have him killed and marry Bathsheba himself. He did it. Do you realize that David's sin with Bathsheba violated at least seven of the Ten Commandments. He committed adultery. He committed idolatry by putting value on his sensuous needs and on himself more than on God himself. He obviously coveted, he stole, he lied, and he used God's name in vain because it's not just words, but it's our actions contrary to the Word of God that put God's name in vain. Here's another example, a notorious one. Ahab and Naboth. Ahab is the king of Israel. He's a wicked king with an even more wicked queen named Jezebel. He had everything. He's a king. He had palaces. He had lands. He had whatever he wanted. But when you covet, as Ahab did, it's never, ever enough. And he coveted 
the vineyard next to his palace. It belonged to Naboth. He said, could you sell it? Naboth said no. Ahab goes back to his room in a big sulk. Jezebel says, cheer up, I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. And she did by having him unjustly accused, executed, and very possibly his children may have died as well. And then they took possession of the vineyard and earned the stinging rebuke of the prophet Elijah, who basically said they were dead meat on arrival. And both of them died horrible deaths and live in infamy in scripture. And then I think the worst example of all of the murderous intention, also due to covetousness, is Judas Iscariot towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, Judas knew Jesus well. He was one of the 12 disciples. He heard the sermons, he saw the miracles, he experienced the power of God, even himself. And yet, I often wondered, why did Judas betray Jesus? It puzzled me for years, and then finally it dawned. It's called money. Money, power, these are things people covet, and they're willing to crush others and destroy others in order to obtain. Yes, Judas had remorse, and he threw the 30 pieces of silver back, but I still am haunted by the words of Jesus when he spoke of Judas, saying, better if that man had never been born. So I've given you three killers so far, the one that pulls the trigger, the one that's abusive in rhetoric, action, and the like, and of course, the carnal human nature. But there's a fourth one, and he's the worst of them all. He's described in Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, 9 speaks of the devil, the old serpent, the great dragon, and Satan, all the same person. Pathway to murder. Lucifer, he had lust, he rebelled, he became a big liar, and never forget, friends, lying perpetually leads to lawlessness. Lying leads to lawlessness. And then he became the devil, in Greek, diabolos, which means accuser who divides, splits people apart, Divide and conquers the modus operandi, taking control by bringing others into conflict and into chaos. Well, Jesus had some choice words to say of the devil. In John chapter 8, verse 44, he said the devil is a murderer from the beginning. And in that very same verse of John eight forty four, he says that the devil is a liar and the father of lies. Lying friends, is his mother tongue, his native language. And then the same Gospel of John tells us in John 10.10 10, that he is a killer, he is a thief, and he's a destroyer. That's why Jesus came to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. So back to Exodus 20, verse 13. Thou shalt not kill, you shall not murder. There are exceptions to the killing clause. It is permissible, although very undesirable, to kill in self-defense, particularly in a military operation. It is also permitted, although again, very limited and in exceptional cases, to kill someone as capital punishment after due process of law. Now, not everyone believes in capital punishment, and I thoroughly, totally understand. But these are not considered murder, but everything else does. However, if you want the real meaning of the sixth commandment, you have to come to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's the one that explains everything through the Holy Spirit. Go to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. He goes further and deeper than just the mere words, you shall not murder. Let me read it to you from Matthew chapter 5, Verse 21 and 22. These are the words of Christ himself. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, Raka, R-A-C-A, means vain, fellow and empty-headed, 
shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Ooh. You feel it sizzle as you read the text. That's Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Now let's have some context. Jesus called people fools. Paul called people fools. He called the Galatian church foolish because they thought they could start off their Christian life in the spirit, being born again, baptized, filled, and walking in the spirit, and then be perfected by doing religious works. He called them the foolish Galatians of Galatians 3, chapter 1. Also, the book of Proverbs regularly calls people foolish or indulging in folly. All of these sources can say fool and be blameless. So what's the issue? Is it the word or is it the heart of hate behind the word? Think of it this way. I'm going to give you another passage of scripture. And this is both concerning, but it's also glorious. 1 John chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. That's 1 John 3, 13 to 15. Friends, we pull the trigger with our attitude. We pull the trigger with our thoughts. We pull the trigger with our words. And we pull the trigger, eventually, with our actions. From God's perspective, all these things are part of the commandment that we violate when it says, you shall not murder. So remember, the pathway to murder is to covet, to hate, to defame, to lie, to steal, to murder in the heart, and to play with fire. Hatred in the heart, let me put it to you this clearly, hatred in the heart can lead to murder with the hand. Well, now that we know what the problem is, what is the solution? The pathway to life, instead of taking a life, we're giving life. It's through the love of God, it's through blessing people, it's through forgiveness, it's through prayer, and it's through peacemaking. Those who are peacemakers, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 9, shall be called the sons of God. So let me repeat, if we're going to be people who spawn life and not death, get rid of the hatred, get rid of the covetousness, get rid of the defamation, the lying, the stealing, all these things. Because, as I said, you're playing with fire. Come to love, bless, and if you have aught against anyone, forgive them. Because if you don't forgive them, and you persist in it, and you ponder it, and you fume over it, you're on the pathway from life onto the pathway of death. We don't want to be like that. We want to be like our Heavenly Father, and we are like Him when we love one another. I commend to you 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. God is love. He doesn't just love, he's the personification of love. And we want to be likewise. So what I suggest is simple. Come to Jesus Christ, acknowledge your hatred, your unforgiveness, your bitterness, and say you want to go all the way, Jesus' way. And then the Holy Spirit will come and he will help you. He will teach you all things. He will bring to your members all things that Christ has commanded. He will put a check in your spirit if you're going the wrong way. He will affirm you with peace and joy when you're heading in the right way. It's almost like a personal life coach within your own being that you carry wherever you go. And remember that when you walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5.16, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It's as simple as that. So let me lead you in a prayer of repentance and faith. And with that, you can go from darkness to light, from death to life, 
from hatred to love, and you will never be guilty of being the one that pulls the trigger. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your wonderful word, the Ten Commandments, the Sixth Commandment. Lord, we don't just want to avoid killing people with our hands. We want to avoid killing them with our heart because it's really the same thing and gets the same penalty. So we confess our hate, our bitterness, our unforgiveness. We say we repudiate these things and we thank you for the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all these things. And now by your wonderful Holy Spirit, the word says that the Holy Spirit spreads the love of God in our hearts. So Holy Spirit, baptize us in love, baptize us in the fruit of the Spirit, baptize us in yourself, and fill us afresh so we may walk the path of the just, which has a shining light that shines more and more to the perfect day. We bless you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us here at Global Pulpit. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Look forward to sharing with you in the future God's wonderful word for today for the nations.